19. It had been three days since they'd left what remained of Starbase 5. The installation of Samaya's emitters had taken the better part of the first day, but with Reach and Zenfor's help, Cass had managed to integrate them into Tempest Systems, allowing the ship to emit a signal that effectively blocked the ship from any long-range Athru scanners. That wasn't to say they were completely safe. If they happened upon any Athru ships, the aliens would still be able to see Tempest bright as day. But it added a layer of protection Cass thought the crew found comforting. As soon as the system had been activated, Evie had ordered them directly to Untu. The integration of the two crews had gone smoother than he would have expected. Anyone from Samaya's camp who had any kind of coalition training had been assigned a new job, and most were ecstatic to be working on board a starship again. The families and civilians had been relegated duties as well, but easier tasks such as manifold cleaning or upkeep. Evie had been insistent everyone had a purpose to keep them busy. She didn't want people sitting around, pondering the despair of their situation. Cass had been relieved to find she didn't seem affected by the stress of what had happened. He'd spoken to Box about the possibility of doing the procedure again in the event the blocks failed, though Box had seemed particularly hesitant. He hoped it wouldn't be necessary, and as she seemed to be doing fine without the memories, Cass didn't want to upset the balance. He glanced over to Samaya, who had taken a permanent position on the bridge at the specialist station, his old posting when he first arrived aboard. He couldn't help thinking about the irony. Box and Zax had managed to fix her up and repair the damage to her body from both the shuttle impact and Zenfor's carelessness, which he still needed to write up in a report. He'd hoped he'd never have been in this position, as they had no real way to discipline Zenfor against her will, if that's what Evie decided to do but it was still something that needed to be done. As soon as they were in a stable orbit around Untu, he'd take an hour and make the full report for Evie. If he could be there when she read it, it might not be so bad, and they could decide how to handle the situation together. Approaching the Usu system, Rod reported. Take us out of the undercurrent, prepare to open the comms, Evie said. Hopefully we'll find someone friendly down there. Don't count on it. Samaya said from behind her. Cass turned and screwed up his face at her. What? she mouthed, shrugging. It's true. Cass glanced back over to Zal as the ship came out of the undercurrent. He wasn't sure what he was expecting. Perhaps a look of excitement or elation, even though he knew that wasn't likely. Zal wouldn't have programmed another face just for when they approached his home. And as he presumed... Zal stood there, facing the screen with a completely neutral look. Though Cass knew he had to be thrilled to be back home, especially after all this time. Put us into orbit around the homeworld, Evie said. That doesn't look right, Zal said, once the dark blue orb became clear on the screen. There seems to be an abundance of cloud cover. He's right, Samaya said. Comparing what we're seeing now with what's in the Coalition database... The planet has at least 20% more vapor and particulate matter in the atmosphere. Evie stood, examining the image before them. What could have caused... Incoming message, Captain, Talia said. Cass realized he wasn't just looking at the planet, but two small silver ships heading their way. His heart jumped into his chest. Could the Athru have taken over Untu? Source of the transmission? Evie asked. The planet's surface... Cass watched Evie rub her thumbs up and down the length of her fingers, while keeping her wrists locked. See if you can't get a better look at those ships before we answer. The image on the screen zoomed in, and Cass let out a breath. They appear to be coalition vessels. In fact, that's the Winston. The survey ship Box and I almost boarded back on Starbase 8. As a survey ship, it had wings that swept forward, and the Winston had a unique pink job with accented stripes. They were worn and faded, but still there. It also appeared there had been some modifications to its superstructure, as small black protrusions stuck out from the hull, on both ships. The comm is coming through again, Captain. Urgent, Talia said. Evie motioned to allow the connection. 
The screen changed to show a darkened room with a bluish-red creature in the middle of the frame, standing atop a pile of what looked to cast like a pile of volcanic rock, even though the image was from inside and not out. Identify yourselves, a processed voice said, sounding similar to Zal's deep and foreboding speech, only slightly higher in pitch. This is the Coalition Starship Tempest. May we... Impossible, the Untuburu said. Its sharp claws went up into the air as the image disappeared, replaced by the two approaching ships. They're charging weapons, Talia said, alarm in her voice. Raise the armor, Evie replied, taking a seat, and open the comm again. Even if they don't respond, I want them to listen. They're not going to believe us, Wolf said. There was an edge to her voice Cass either hadn't heard before or hadn't been aware of. Either way, it was easy to tell she was upset about something. And by the tone of her voice, she was practicing a great amount of restraint keeping it all in. Cass shot her a look, and she shook her head, returning to her duties. Cass kept an eye on Zal while Talia performed her tasks. He hadn't moved, only continued to stare out at the image of his homeworld. Ready, Captain. Untubural homeworld, this is Tempest. Our operations officer is one of your people. I'll let him explain for himself. She gestured to Zal to say something. He nodded. Priestess, this is Zal Akno. I was part of the primary ministry until joining the coalition military, from your perspective almost thirty years ago. Please allow us to speak. I am here by Kor's will. The ships are slowing, Talia said, powering down weapons. The image of the planet was replaced by the Untuburu again, smoke rising behind her from the rocks. Akno, your family was one of the Nine Cabals. Yes, Priestess. But you were reported dead, along with your ship, lost to the depths of space almost. The Priestess moved closer to the screen, her small green eyes and her shell now visible. Allow me to see you, so I know it is not an Athru trick. No tricks, priestess. But the covenants are waived. This is too dire, she said. Zal nodded, opening his robe and pinning it back behind him. Beneath was his metal exoskeleton, which began a process of moving and shifting within itself. As more of the rods and bars holding the exoskeleton moved away, the creature inside, the real Zal, became visible. He had four different tubes running into different parts of his body, presumably to keep him alive in the ship's climate. They must have been what failed down on the planet. "'Tis true,' the priestess said. "'Blessed be to Kor, you are alive.' Zal began the process of closing the exoskeleton again, until he could rewrap his robe. Cass realized he was staring and turned his gaze elsewhere. My ship has been lost in an unknown part of space for a long time. We have returned seeking refuge, he said once he was fully clothed again. You will not find it here, the priestess said. Please return to us and separate yourself from these humans. They will be the death of you. Evie stepped forward. Priestess, if I may... You may not, she replied sharply. We want nothing to do with you. Return him to us, and we will allow you to leave the system unharmed, as long as you promise never to return. Cass flashed a glance at Samaya. Her lips were pursed, and she stared at the floor, shaking her head. She'd been right. Priestess, I will not come willingly, Zal replied, not unless you are willing to hear us out. The Untuburu stared at the screen a moment. I will consider it. Bring yourself to us, and I promise to hear you. Zal shook his head. No, priestess. You must come to us. I am blasphemous in my words, but given your state, you may attempt to abscond with me. We will speak on board my ship. The priestess raised her claws again, shaking them back and forth. Cass wished he'd paid more attention to Laska when she'd been going over Untuburu body language. Very well. But I will bring guards of the red light. They will ensure my safety. If the humans deceive us, my ships will destroy them. 
Cass had to bite his tongue to keep his retort down. The Winston and the other ship looked like pieces of junk compared to Tempest, and they didn't have all the sill upgrades Zenfor had provided them. He doubted if they could even get a shot through the ship's armor in their state. Then we are agreed, Zal said, turning back to Evie. Thank you, Zal. Priestess, we look forward to receiving you. The Untuburu cut the line at Evie's last word. That went about as well as you could have hoped, Samaya said. Evie addressed Zal. Good work. I think you have a knack for diplomacy. It comes from knowing my people, Zal said. She is terrified and distrustful. I hate to say this, but we must be careful. I never thought I would need to say that about another of my species, but it seems the Athru have made deep, irreversible changes within my people. Evie stepped down from her chair and placed a hand on his shoulder. Maybe not. Let's see what she says before passing judgment. Cass sat at the long table of the conference room, his leg bouncing beneath him. Around him sat Evie, Samaya, to help facilitate the fact they'd been gone so long, and Zal at the far end of the table by himself. Cass could see this going either well or badly. There was no in-between. The fact the Untubrul were so xenophobic about humanity didn't instill a lot of confidence in him, but Evie said they needed to focus on understanding where the Untubrul were coming from and that he needed to be patient. Never in his life had he been so glad for memory modifiers. The doors to the conference room opened to reveal three tall beings in blue robes, holographic faces on each of them. Though the two in the back, their faces were dimmed, as if the brightness of their emitters had been turned down. It gave them the appearance of wearing veils. And as they moved, their robes reflected the tinge of crimson. It was subtle, but also beautiful, in front was, Cass assumed, the priestess, her face with a neutral expression. As they entered, everyone stood while Talia and two other security officers filed in behind the Unuburu. Priestess, Evie said, approaching her, thank you for agreeing to this. I was not given much choice, she replied, the deep voice a complete mismatch to the face bearing it. But if it allows me to save just one Unuburu life, I will take it. She turned to Zal. He bowed before her. Priestess, many thanks for your journey. He raised back up. You have already met Captain Diazal. This is Commander Ribot and Captain Geisen. He gestured to the priestess. High Priestess Las Riara of the First Cabal of Kor. Please have a seat, Evie said. I prefer to stand. This will not take long. She turned her attention to Zal. You must come home. How you have survived this long, I do not know. But the humans are being exterminated. Eventually, the Athru will reach this ship. And if you are among them, you will be deemed a collaborator and executed. Is that what happened to the Untuburu on Earth? Evie asked. Las ignored her. You must see the danger. I am no stranger to risk, Zal said but I took an oath to the Coalition. I will not abandon my crewmates, especially not now, when so much has been lost. Priestess, if I may, Samaya said, gesturing. The priestess nodded. The Tempest and her crew have been through a uh, unique situation. None of them have experienced the horrors of the last eighteen years. To most of them, the Coalition was intact a few weeks ago. How is this possible? she asked. It's complicated, Evie replied. We found the planet where the Athru originated from, but they had already left. They used time as a sort of weapon, and my crew, we got caught up in it. The priestess sighed. Then you do not know, and it is up to me to tell you. She took a seat after all. Everyone else followed suit. I couldn't understand, walking through your ship how it came to us in such pristine condition. I haven't seen a coalition ship like this in fifteen years. The last humans we encountered were over a decade ago, a group of refugees looking for safe haven. 
much as my people are now, Samaya said. We had assumed the Atu had exterminated all of you. Information doesn't come often. What can you tell us about the state of the coalition? Evie asked, leaning forward. Last dismissed the comet with a wave of her hand. The coalition is no more. We tried to fight back, but any resistance was immediately destroyed. But they only wanted the humans. Anyone found to be harboring them or assisting them shared their fate. Otherwise, they left us alone. You can't believe they would just stop with humanity, Cass said. That you or the Maxians or the Lex McCall would be next. We didn't think they would, which was why, in the beginning, the Coalition came together to fight. But we were no match for them. They tore through the Core Worlds like it was nothing. A priest of mine was aboard a Coalition ship when they destroyed Cypaxia from space. Cass saw Evie flinch. He couldn't quite believe it himself. What about Earth? And Claxia Prime? Cass asked. She shook her head. I've only heard rumors. When it became clear we could not win, the Athru took the fight a step further and destroyed our supply lines as well as the communication relays. Any attempts to get the infrastructure back up have failed. As a result, we lost a lot of people before we could figure out how to sustain ourselves again. We were over-reliant on the interconnectivity of the coalition. It had stood for over two thousand years, Samaya said. It was a reasonable assumption. Cass glanced at Evie, whose eyes shimmered. She saw him staring at her and turned away, but not quick enough that he didn't see a tear fall. When she turned back, they were dry again. We don't leave our system anymore, Las said, and we don't know where the Athru are. You could have led them to us, in which case my only hope is to plead for mercy, though they aren't known for it. We didn't lead anyone here, Cass said. We have a technology that disrupts their scanners. Regardless, Las replied, I would take my citizen and be done with you. Humanity is too dangerous. Zal stood. I have told you, I will not abandon my crew. They are my family. The priestess stood in kind. Saul, you do not understand the hardships of the last eighteen years, the sacrifices our people have made. We need you to return. Things on Usu are not well. Is that why the atmosphere looks different? he asked. She dropped her head. Without technology from the Husmus Riza and the Core Worlds, our pollution issues have become problematic. We are working on some solutions, but they are slow. And you haven't tried to send an envoy to the Husmus Risa? Evie asked. You have ships. Lass spread her holographic hands at the table. You are not hearing me. The supply chains are gone. Without the Claxians, we can't get replacement conduits for the undercurrent generators. We don't have the materials to construct those units ourselves, and most of those who knew how are long dead. We are doing well to feed our people. Even that has become a challenge. I, I apologize. I didn't realize. She waved a hand dismissively. This has gone on long enough. Zal, you are to return home. Kor decrees it. Cass couldn't be sure, as her face still hadn't changed, but he sensed she was not only upset and frustrated, but very scared. Priestess, as I have said, I will not leave my crew. They saved my life, and I do not break my vows. He hadn't moved a centimeter. You are breaking your vows to Kor at this very moment, the priestess argued. Now, come with us. The two guards moved around the table. Now, wait a minute, Evie said. No one is forcibly removing anyone from this ship. If he says he doesn't want to go, he's not going. She nodded to Talia and the security officers, who stepped forward. Las regarded them, then turned back to Zal. You are making a mistake. For this, you will be excommunicated. 
you do not violate the will of Kor. It is not Kor's will, but yours, priestess, Zal replied. Cass had never seen it, but if an Untuburu could look shocked, it would be how he described Lass at that moment. She jerked back, as if someone had hit her, and her navy robes fluttered around her. Return us to our shuttle, now. There was an added threat under her voice. Anson, please escort the delegation back to Bay One, Evie said. Talia motioned for the other security officers to guide all three Untuburu to the doors. The priestess didn't say another word, only left the room with her head held high. When they were gone, Evie turned to Zal. I'm sorry about that. Are you all right? I will be, Captain. For now, I wish to return to duty. He hadn't taken his gaze off the door they'd exited through. Of course. Thank you for your loyalty. I know that can't have been easy. When Zal reached the door, he turned back to them. The coalition might not exist out there anymore, but it still exists in here. As long as Tempest flies, it will exist for me. Then he was gone, leaving the three humans alone with their thoughts. 20. What do you think? Evie asked, taking her chair in the command room. As soon as the Untuburu's delegation left the ship, she'd order them out and away from the planet, parking the ship out beyond the system's heliosphere. Everyone else had gone back to their duties, while she and Cass had come together to plan their next moves. I think their society is in trouble, and they don't want any more problems. I'm half surprised she didn't try to take the ship from us. Evie shook her head. Even the Untubru have limits. Plus, she's probably too afraid of the Atru finding us. Cass leaned back in his chair. Is it crazy that I want to go to Husmus Risa and Klaxia Prime to get everything they need and bring it back to them? Evie smiled. Be the galaxy's last remaining courier service? A look of disgust passed across his face. Oh, ooh, I hadn't thought of it like that. Never mind. Bad memories? She asked. Speaking of which, what do you think about heading for Sargant's space? Samaya said she didn't know what happened to the Sargans, but considering only half of them are human, they might still be operating. In fact, without the coalition, they might be thriving. She pursed her lips. There's a cheerful thought. Crime gangs roaming the stars unchecked. He shrugged. Better than nothing. Even with the colony's technology, we're bound to run across the Athru one day. And we can't count on the coalition for help. So maybe it's time to make some friends out of old enemies. Evie shook her head. Even if we do, how do we fight an enemy that can destroy planets? You heard what they did at Cypaxia. She tried not to think of the implications. But that planet had millions of people on it, including Macha and the entire team who had taken care of her father. Maybe they had some warning and got off before the attack came, but Evie didn't think so. Yeah, Cass replied, shifting his eyes to the side. He's lying to you. Evie almost started at the sound of the voice. It was the same one she'd heard in the hallway, except this time it was definitely in her head. She didn't need this, not now. After that event, she'd hoped this little problem had resolved itself with some better sleep and a more structured regimen. And what could he be lying about anyway? The destruction of Cypaxia? They'd both heard it from the priestess. A lie of omission is still a lie. Are you okay? Cass asked. Evie glanced up. What had she just been doing? No, but I'm managing, she replied. It was the truth. Their singular focus would very soon transform from searching for answers to searching for a way to survive. There were no safe ports, no stations where they could dock. Even though they had plenty of resources at the moment, eventually those would wear down, especially if they found more refugees, which Evie hoped they would. They needed to protect as many people as they could. That's more than I can say for some of the crew. I've been observing the past few days, and... What? I'm afraid I'm seeing some cracks. 
Stories are getting around about what's been happening the last 18 years, and people are on edge. What happens to the chain of command when there's no one left to enforce it? He was talking about a mutiny, or uncontrolled chaos on the ship. Was that possible, though? She knew her crew, or at least she thought she did. A subset of them had been without her for a long time. What if something else was going on? Do you think that's an issue? He shook his head. I don't know. But I don't want to be blindsided. People have been acting out more. I'm sure you've noticed. Fulf. Today hadn't been her first outburst on the bridge. But Evie had given her some leeway due to the circumstances of their situation. Maybe she needed to crack down more. Cass nodded. And that brings up another point I need to discuss. I've been putting it off. She gestured for him to go ahead. Remember when Samaya was in sickbay for those injuries? They weren't all caused by the shuttle. Creases of furrow appeared in her forehead. What were they from? Before she took off to find the others, there was an incident with Zenfor down to the bay. Zenfor knows Samaya was on the Atlas and was one of the people responsible for the destruction of the Sill ship. Oh, God damn it! I forgot all about that, Evie said, rubbing her head. What happened? Zenfor knocked her to the side, and she slammed against the bulkhead. I don't think she meant to hurt her, but with Zenfor's strength, and Captain Geisen's age, exactly. Samaya didn't want me to say anything. She feels responsible. But at the same time, it qualifies as an assault. He leaned forward. I've already spoken to her about it, and she's agreed not to engage with Samaya anymore. But that's not exactly a punishment for her actions. To be honest, I don't know what we could do about it. It's not like we can throw her in the brig. Why not? He sputtered. But because she's... How do you think that will go over? Not to mention, we need her to run the advanced engine drive. Otherwise, it will take us forever to get anywhere. She ran her hands down her face. Zenfor respected the process of law. Evie wondered if she could separate her own actions from that process. Try this. Lay out the situation for her with all the evidence and ask her what she thinks is an appropriate punishment. You're kidding. I'm not. Try it. See how she responds. At the very least, it will get her thinking about her actions, if she's not already. I take your point, but we can't just leave it. We have to maintain some kind of order on this ship, otherwise it will descend into chaos. Confronting Zenfor was a risk. And if Sester had been awake, she would have asked him to do it. But considering Cass was still technically the liaison between the Coalition and the Sill, the job fell to him. She also suspected Zenfor had a soft spot for Cass somewhere deep inside, thus making him the best candidate. Anyone else, and she feared for their safety. He threw his hands up. Fine. But if I end up in surgery, you're going to give me two weeks off. She laughed. Fine, if you'll take it. Do not joke with him. He lies. She was sick of this. Yeah, well, let's put that to the test, then, and I'll show you how wrong you are. Evie was tired of this voice dictating how she should feel or what she should know. Cass, I need to ask you something, and I'm going to need you to be honest with me. Concern clouded his face. Okay. Does the word esterva mean anything to you? I'm not sure. Was his eyelid twitching? She couldn't be sure. But that could be from exhaustion, too. They had just endured a particularly harrowing experience with a priestess. Where did you hear it? Why does that matter? He shrugged. Just looking for some context. It might help me recall. He's lying. I, I don't know. It just came to me. It's silly. Never mind. They should move on to other matters. This wasn't worth arguing over. You don't trust him. I told you. As for our next destination, I think Captain Geisen is right. If we head for any of the other core worlds, we'll get a similar response, or worse. 
Can you imagine what we might find at KPX-4? Given the Utuburu's position, the KPX might just blow us out of the sky for coming into the system, assuming it's still there. She was having a difficult time concentrating on her own words. Her mind kept replaying that eye twitch. Sil space, he suggested. Assuming we don't piss Zenvor off so much she destroys the ship, she might be able to negotiate a safe passage. Especially after they see how we held up our end of the bargain. Did we, though? What about Maless? Assuming Starbase 8 was hit the way Captain Geisen said it was, I wouldn't expect there to have been any survivors. Plus, it will take seasons, if not longer, to get to Sil space, even with all the enhancements. I don't want to be out in the open that long. I'm assuming you're arguing because you have a better plan. He'd relaxed back into his seat. The lying SOB had the gall to relax. No, she didn't have any evidence he was lying. Everything was fine and normal. She just had to get rid of this nagging voice in her head, wherever it was coming from. In fact, I do. Sisk. He tensed again. Your old homeworld? Technically, since I spent most of my childhood there, I still have some friends who live on Sisk. Or I did. And since it isn't part of the Coalition, not officially anyway, maybe the Athru left it alone. Sisk had been in a decades-long treaty agreement with the Coalition, always in the process of applying or canceling their application to the Coalition, depending on which of the twelve species on the planet was in power at the time. The Krillix would be against, but then the Urungu would win the elections and resubmit the application. But by the time the Coalition began the process, the Kormoffs would take over, or some other political party, and put the process on hold. Despite the majority of the planet wanting to be a part of the coalition, it was a maddening process due to the short cycles of Sisk's election processes. Leaving that turmoil for the stability of the coalition had been one of Evie's proudest moments. And it had proven to her what she'd always known, that the coalition was worth it, despite all the trouble her government went through. She'd hoped one day soon they would put all their squabbling aside and do what was best for Sisk. But now it looked like that possibility was lost. You think because there were so few humans, they missed it. She nodded. When I left, there were just three of us on the entire planet. I can't believe the Athru would bother for that. And since they're on the edge of Coalition space, they might not be as cut off as some of the core worlds. They might still be communicating with other local species. It means we have to head in the opposite direction, away from the core worlds, he said. Is that a bad thing? I'm not saying we have to stay there forever, but maybe it will allow us to regroup, find some allies, figure out if the Atru have any weaknesses. He leaned forward again. Are you saying you want to go after them, despite their power levels? I don't know, she replied. But if we have the capability, whatever it is, to stop them, and we don't use it, we're no better than they are. The coalition was gone. She had to accept that. But that didn't mean this was the new norm. She refused to allow 2,000 years of unity to disappear just because one species was eliminated or almost eliminated. A new, stronger coalition would not fall with the loss of one of its members, even a founding member. It would endure if they could find a way to fight back. 21. Cass made his way through the corridors in a daze. After the meeting, Evie said she was taking off early, as she had a headache, and Cass had wanted to stay on the bridge, but he just couldn't. She knew about Asterva. The memory block had failed, or it had partially failed. How else could she have known that name? He thought back to the small orb Marshall had given him that was just sitting in a drawer in his quarters. He'd done everything he could to try and activate it, but so far nothing had worked, and he feared what might happen if Evie touched or even saw it. What might it do to her? Unleash the Athru side again? There was no way to be certain. Despite the fact obscuring her memories had resulted in her going back to mostly normal, the box in his mind he tried to shove away was now front and center, the chains holding it shut rattling away in his consciousness. He needed some relief. Cass tapped the personal comm. 
Locate Captain Geisen for me. She's on level two, Commander, Saul replied, his voice monotone. Would you like me to inform her you're looking for her? No. Where on to? Stellar observation. Thanks, Saul. He turned off the comm. Stellar observation. He should have figured. She and her husband had been starhounds like him, always looking, always charting. Cass took the hypervator five floors up and stepped off to a magnificent view of the undercurrent above and to the sides of him, through the observation windows. Beyond the green haze of the undercurrent, it was easy to make out the stars beyond, streaking by as if they'd been pulled like taffy. Further on down the hallway stood Samaya, staring up at the stars as they whipped by. She caught Cass's eye as he approached and turned back to watching the stars. He loved views like this she said. Never could get enough. Cass came up beside her and leaned on the edge of the window, staring out into the emerald-tinted darkness. Maybe he just needed to be in the company of someone from before, before he'd learned the truth about the Coalition, before he'd grown up. He'd refused to think about that time from before, ever since escaping from Cthora. In fact, he'd sworn at the time he'd never think of it again, how things could change. I remember the day we got the assignment about the Atlas, because it was the last day anything felt normal. In his periphery, he saw her nod, but it was a subtle movement. The good old days, he squinted. That's not true. The last day anything felt normal was the one before we found the Sill ship. I remember hoping we never found one that they were too crafty for us and we'd have to go home empty. You knew Rutledge better than that. There was humor in her voice, like they were both in on the same joke. He would have driven us into oblivion before giving up. And kept on driving. Cass turned to her, looking in her remaining eye. There was so much pain in there, more than a few lifetimes worth. Samaya? Where's John? For a moment, a smile played on her lips, then disappeared. She lifted her eye patch and ran her finger underneath. Still itches sometimes, whenever I think of him. Sometimes I think I wasn't supposed to make it, that we were supposed to die together, and somewhere along the line, the universe made a mistake. He listened without interrupting. It was obvious this was painful, and he was thankful she was finally willing to open up about it. John had been his friend as well. The three of them had always gotten along. He could recall the three of them getting together in the Geisens' quarters, having weekly dinners, despite the fact none of them could cook. They weren't the only people on the ship Cass socialized with, but they'd been some of his favorites, and John had been one hell of a poker player when they had the opportunity. It was about two years after the initial attacks. We'd been on Lien, out near Denorius, he nodded. It was a planet outside Coalition space, but close enough to the border so the people were friendly to the Coalition, and even provided a port of respite. We thought we might stay there for a while until we heard from Coalition Central, but it turned out to be a short pit stop. She shook her head. We should have stayed. We should have just taken our chances there. I don't know what happened to Lien after we left. It could have been obliterated, for all I know. We got a com from a ship in orbit, the USCS Endure, she smiled. John took it as a sign of good luck. I think he thought this war, she paused on the word, was only a temporary situation, and that we'd be back on our own ship or at another posting in six months. He was always the optimist, Cass said. Until his dying day. The Endure's captain ordered all Coalition personnel on the planet to come aboard to help where we could. His ship had managed to escape out of two different Athru traps, and the crew had come to think of the ship itself as the symbol the Coalition needed against their new enemy. And back then, all the other species were still helping. So when we came aboard, it was just like being on any other starship. Almost like nothing had happened at all. 
The ship needed a few repairs, but other than that, she was spaceworthy. Not unlike Tempest. She turned back to the view. Unfortunately, what had saved the Endure had been more luck than skill, which became painfully obvious after only a few weeks aboard. We'd set course for the closest starbase, which had been Troy Delta. Cass furrowed his brow. He wasn't familiar with that designation. She must have seen the confusion. Right. After the attacks took out the primary starbases, like five and eight, the Coalition began converting old mining asteroids into makeshift havens, each with a different designation due to their location and overall commander. This one was under Admiral Troy, except when we arrived, along with two other Coalition vessels, the Athru were already waiting. They used their technology to hide themselves in plain sight, waiting for the fleet to converge. The word fleet came out with so much vitriol, for a moment Cass thought someone else had said it. They decimated us, and the Endure did anything but. The captain was more concerned with using the ship as a symbol than saving the crew, and we were blown apart. John and I barely had time to get to one of the escape pods before the ship was destroyed. Except, in the blast, our pod was hit and ripped open like a piece of tin. Cass didn't dare say a word. Her voice was tinged with hurt, anger, sadness, and a thousand more emotions in between. John was pulled out immediately, and I was yanked forward, where my face went straight into the starboard auxiliary panel. She pointed to her eye. But I didn't feel a thing because I was out cold. I don't know how it happened, but one of us must have hit the safety field, which should have come on when the pod was opened. For some reason it didn't, and when I awoke, I was alone in the pod, floating among the bits of the asteroids. Nothing but an electromagnetic field between me and death. I considered dropping it right there and following him out, but I couldn't do it. When I got over the shock of what happened, I used the thrusters to take me back to the station, which had been decimated, and the Athru were gone. At least that's what I told myself. Otherwise, why would they have let me live? Samaya, I'm sorry. That's horrible. She shrugged. Though we could tell it was a front. The move was too perfect, too practiced. It's long in the past now, she said. How did you survive out there? When they destroyed the station, they'd only destroyed the top levels where the people were. Some of the subterranean levels were still habitable. I stayed down below for about three weeks, until an Erustian scavenger crew came looking for spare parts. I managed to barter a ride with them. She held up her hands. The rest was pretty much as you expect. Which is why this looks so nasty. She lifted up the eye patch to show the ragged flesh underneath. It was an ugly wound, one that hadn't been healed by coalition science. Why don't you get Zax to... Don't, she said, dropping the patch over the skin again. If I didn't want to remember, I'd have gotten it fixed long ago. It's the last thing that connects me to him. And I'm going to be this way until the day I die. Fair enough. He wasn't about to begrudge someone their memory of a loved one. What made you stop? What? He didn't take his eyes off the stars streaking by. What made you stop yourself from dropping the field? You knew the seriousness of the situation. Why not just end it? Cass had never asked such a question of anyone, especially not someone who knew him well. But he couldn't keep from thinking what he might have done in a similar instance. Samaya was quiet for a few minutes. Maybe I was too much of a coward, she finally said. I had my finger on the button. All I had to do was exert a small amount of pressure and... She shook her head. I don't think that's it, he replied. I think you wanted to keep fighting, that you weren't going to let them win. Pushing that button would have been too easy. Maybe, 
she replied. I think sometimes life is supposed to be hard. Really hard. I did something recently where I took the easy path. And now I'm not so sure I should have done it. Samaya stifled a laugh. You? The easy path? The easy path would have been to fire on that sail ship, to follow the orders you were given, and not look back. I was stupid then, too idealistic. Knowing what I know now, I'm not sure I could say I'd make the same choice. That's true of all of us, she replied. Fifty-nine years I've been alive in this universe, and every day has given me insight I didn't have the day before. But we can't go back and change the decisions we've already made. They were made by the people we were in those moments, and those moments shaped who we are now. If we hadn't done what we did in the past, we wouldn't be here to question those decisions now. Reflection is integral to life, but it doesn't define who you are. I don't. You are a good person, Cass. Do you make mistakes? Of course. But at your core, you always try to do the right thing. Whatever decision you made, the fact that you're questioning it now tells you all you need to know. If you could go back, you'd stand up to Rutledge again and again and again, no matter how much trouble or pain it caused you. Because that's who you are. She sighed, leaning against the window. And I would have always waited, not coming to your defense in time, but redeeming myself in the end. That's who I am. Was she right? He'd always figured, if given the chance, he might have taken another path aboard the Atlas. But perhaps not. Maybe rebelling against Rutledge had always been a part of him, and no matter what circumstances led him there, he would always have done what he considered right in that moment. Did that mean his decision about Evie had been correct? So far it had worked out, and he'd only had a minor relapse. He'd have to trust his judgment of the moment was correct, just like Samaya's had been. Hers had ended up saving her life, and he hoped a similar outcome from what he'd done to Evie. What are you thinking about? I can see the gears turning, Samaya said. I guess I'm trying to decide if I can trust myself, he replied. If he'd made the right call seven years ago, did that mean he could still make the right call today? She took on a kindly smile, reminiscent of a parent who had to sue with their child. In some ways, she was his senior, even though he'd been her superior officer back on their ship. But since finding her again, the experience of age had given her a wisdom she hadn't possessed when he'd last seen her. Let's put it this way. I trust you over a lot of other people. Despite his hopes, that didn't make him feel any better. 22. Evie had just finished going over the updated astrometric data provided by Ensign River. A course to Sisk would only take them three more days, if they could maintain the undercurrent. Though River had provided that two unexpected adjustments to the course would need to be made due to different gravitational phenomena along the way. Evie hadn't wanted to ask, but the only thing that could have changed the relative gravity in such a way was the loss of nearby stars, which meant the Athru had been busy. Comparing the data to the maps they'd had on file, it looked like the Athru had more than likely taken out Zeta Draconis and Slaton Incero. Both had been home to old human colonies on multiple planets in each system. She'd never been, but she'd heard the sunsets on Zeta Tracona VI were to die for. And it only reinforced just how ruthless the Athru had been. She couldn't understand why they were just going for human settlements. Why not any of the other coalition species? What was so special about the human race? She tried not to spend too much time thinking about it, but sometimes she couldn't help wondering how many humans were left. If the Athru had destroyed Earth and all of the core worlds, it meant trillions of lives, which in turn meant humanity was probably an endangered species now. Perhaps between the Coalition and the Sargans, there might still be a good number of them left, but things could never go back to the way they were before. It just wasn't possible. 
and even though she hadn't had any close family before, she still felt the loss of all those lives. Evie set the report to the side. Lieutenant Rond, please make the necessary course corrections. He acknowledged and made a quick change while River glanced back at her from her seat. Evie winked, producing a smile on River's face. The Ensign had been nothing but reliable, even during their time down on the planet, and she was one hell of a navigator. Evie needed to review the crew reports again. Maybe there was room for... Excuse me, Captain. Evie glanced up to see Wolf beside her chair, her hands clasped behind her back. Yes, Commander? I wanted to suggest an alternate course of action, she said. But Evie could tell there was something behind her words. Fear, perhaps? Or anger, she wasn't sure. An alternate course to Sisk? No, ma'am. We've seen what the Otto can do. And with how much time has passed, it's unlikely to think they haven't infiltrated every corner of the coalition. The edge in her voice only became harder, as if it were a piece of steel being subjected to heat, then cooled over and over again. I don't think it's in our best interest to stay anywhere near here. Perhaps we should take the ship back out into open space, away from the coalition. Evie nodded, trying to be diplomatic. She could see Wolf was holding something back, but she wasn't sure what. Thank you, Commander. But I'm not going to abandon the coalition. Not yet. Not if there's a chance even some small part of it has survived, like Samaya's crew. Captain, Wolf pressed, I don't think we should stay here. We're just putting the crew in danger. She'd raised her voice just enough so the rest of the bridge could hear her. Evie glanced around, and while she'd tried to do this quietly, it was obvious Wolf had no such compunction. Why don't we talk in the command room, Evie said, standing. Wolf took a step back. So you can talk me down? It isn't going to happen. The rest of the crew deserves to know what's going on. That you're keeping us in the coalition space for your own selfish needs, and that you're putting the rest of us at risk when it's unnecessary. That's enough, Commander, Evie said. Another outburst, and I'll have you relieved of duty. Wolf shook her head. You forget. Technically, I was the captain of the ship for eighteen years. That's about seventeen and a half years more than you. This is my ship, not yours. And I'm not going to stand by while you get us killed for your own hubris. Evie glanced at Talia. Remove her from my bridge. Confine her to her quarters. Wolf backed up to her station as Talia rounded hers, headed for the engineer. Evie's heart was racing, but it wasn't to be unexpected. A lot had changed while they were gone, and she had been prepared for some blowback, though she hadn't thought Wolf would have been so outspoken about it. It was almost as if something else was going on. Before she realized it, Talia had stopped in her tracks. Evie turned to see Wolf with a pulse pistol in her hand, aiming directly for Talia. Don't, Wolf said, the fear audibly present in her voice. Talia glanced at Evie. Do as she says, Ensign, Evie said. She held her hands out in front of her. Commander, Keeley, this isn't necessary. We're not your enemies. Lieutenant Rond, adjust our course to head for open space, beyond coalition borders. Rond turned in his chair, a sheen of sweat on his brow. He looked at Evie expectantly. Don't look at her. Do as I ordered, Wolf yelled. I'm sorry, Commander, but I can't, he said. He locked down his station. I succumbed to the misguided pressure of a superior officer once before. I won't do it again. Despite the circumstances, Evie's heart bloomed with pride. She'd known he was a good kid at heart. It had just taken some time for him to find his path. Don't you all see? If we stay here, we're dead. Just like everyone else in the coalition. There is no more coalition. It's all gone. All of it. She waved the pistol back and forth, and Evie took the opportunity to tap the emergency security strip on her workstation. Get out of the seat. I'll do it myself, Wolf said, the weapon landing at the base of Ron's neck. I'm sorry, Lieutenant, 
but this is for your own good. I can't do that, ma'am, Rod replied, staying put. Wolf gritted her teeth. Talia made a motion to charge her, but she spun at the security officer. The weapon pointed at her again. Move again, and I'll take you down. To save this ship, I'll take everyone on this bridge down if I have to. Fire burned in her eyes, and pain, Evie thought. How long have you been planning this? Evie asked. What are you talking about? There was no planning. It's obvious what we need to do. It's just... You just happen to keep a sidearm tucked away in your station, Talia said. At that, Zal stepped out from behind the op station and approached Wolf. She swung the weapon to him until it made a small clink against his metal chest, muffled only by the thin fabric between them. If you are serious about this, Commander, you have to fire, Zal said. Evie made a move to step forward. Zal, what are you... He held up one hand, and though Wolf flinched, she didn't pull the trigger. Zal's hand came down slowly until it was right on top of the weapon. Release it, he said. The fight went out of Wolf's eyes, and she let go of the weapon, her shoulders slumping. Zal took it, handing it over to Ensign Talia, who checked the gauge on the side. No charge, Talia said. We were never in any danger. Why, Evie said. Wolf just shook her head. Behind Evie, the hypervader doors opened to reveal two security officers along with Cass and Samaya. I saw the alert. What? Cass began. Then his eyes fell on Wolf. What happened? You were right, Evie said. Things are more fragile than we thought. Will you be able to get the undercurrent drive up and running again without her if we need to? Cass glanced at Wolf. I don't know. Maybe. Evie took a deep breath. She couldn't afford to lose one of her best engineers. But what choice did she have? They already had an issue with Zenfor, and now this? If she wanted to maintain some semblance of command on this ship, she had to do what was necessary. Anson, please take the commander to the brig until further notice. Wolf's eyes snapped up, and Evie saw they were shimmering with tears. Yes, ma'am, Talia said, taking Wolf by the arm. Do you mind if I accompany her? Captain Geisen asked. I have some experience in this area. Evie indicated she should go ahead. Geisen had no doubt seen her fair share of people losing their grip over the years. Maybe there was something she could do to help Wolf, at least in the short term. As Talia, Geisen, and the security officers escorted Wolf to the hypervader, Cass came up beside her. You okay? He doesn't care about you. The voice hit Evie like a smack across the face, and she inhaled sharply. What's wrong? Cass asked. Evie rubbed her cheek, trying to play it off. Nothing. Just go talk to Zenfor. I want this situation with her resolved before we get to Sisk. He lingered for a moment his eyes finding hers, then turning away again. What was he looking for? And why did this damned voice keep manifesting? What was going on? Right, he finally said. I'll go take care of it now. Samaya watched as the security chief escorted Wolf into the cell, then came back out, activating the force barrier that would keep her isolated from the rest of the ship, it was the same kind of barrier that had kept Samaya alive in that pod, the kind you couldn't move past unless they were shut off. Staying? the ensign asked Samaya. I was hoping to speak with the commander for a few moments, she replied. Tilia nodded. Crewman Ryder will be just outside if you need anything. One of the other security officers indicated he was Ryder. Thank you. Once they were gone, Samaya took a glance at Wolf, sitting on the bench in the cell, her head between her knees. Feel up to a chat? Samaya asked. Why would you want to talk to me? I'm a traitor, she replied in a pitiful voice. Or you're in a lot of pain. She pulled a chair across the room and sat in front of Wolf's cell. Wolf didn't bother looking up, and Samaya couldn't blame her. But she also knew there was something more going on here. 
and if it was something that could potentially affect the rest of the crew, she needed to find out what. Her eyes took in the commander. Her tan skin, bald head, and long limbs made her stand out more than she otherwise would have. But what caught her interest was the small platinum band on her left ring finger. Married? Used to be, Wolf replied. Before. Me too. What happened? Lost it all. She lifted her head, and tears were falling down her face. If I'd known, I never would have taken this assignment. If you'd known what? What being on board meant. That we wouldn't be here when everyone we knew and loved was killed. That we wouldn't be able to return until years later to survey the wreckage. That we might be the only humans left alive anywhere in the galaxy. Samaya pulled her lips between her teeth, looking for a way in. There was something important here, and she felt a kinship with this woman. It wasn't often you found married couples in the Coalition. Was he in the service, too? She nodded. Chris. He was stationed out near Arkelia. Never liked space travel. At this, a smile grew across her lips. He said he was happy to do his part to help the Coalition, but he'd be damned if he ever stepped foot on a starship. He preferred the planetary assignments. But not you, Samaya said, like it was an obvious fact. Wolf shook her head. I liked traveling too much. We didn't get to see each other often. But when we did, man... She leaned back, and more tears fell down her cheeks. I just miss him so much. I had the pleasure of serving on the same ship as my husband, Samaya said, her voice a little softer. It's great for a while. Until you realize they'll drive you crazy with every little thing. Half the time I would need to take an extra shift so we weren't bouncing off each other all day. I'd give anything to be that close just once, Wolf replied. Samaya so realized she made a mistake. In trying to make light of the situation, she'd only driven home how much luckier she and John had been. And they had been. They'd managed to serve together for nearly ten years, ever since they'd gotten married. And they'd escaped together, been on the run from the Atru together. At one point, she thought everything would be fine as long as she always had him by her side. She turned away from the thoughts. This was Cass's fault. If he hadn't asked about John, he wouldn't be in the forefront of her mind so much. But at least now she understood Wolf better. Maybe we can swing by Arcadia once we're done on Sisk, Samaya said. There's no point, Wolf replied. Why not? She shrugged. He's already dead. She furrowed her brow. How do you know? Arcadia is far out. The Atru may not have hit it, or he could have survived, like I did. You never know. It's worth taking a look. Wolf leveled her tear-filled gaze at Samaya. I already did, she replied. It was the first place we looked when we came back. Samaya was confused. From the way Cass had made it sound, Starbase 5 had been their first stop after returning from the Atru planet. They'd made other stops? I don't understand, she said. When did you visit Arkelia? The first time we returned, Wolf said. Thirteen years ago. Twenty-three. Cass was on his way to engineering, dreading the discussion with Zen 4, when his comm chirped. Boss? He tapped it. Yeah, Box? I need you, right now. Despite the urgency, Cass couldn't help but think this was one of those times when Box was baiting him into saying something stupid, so the robot could record it and whip it out at the most inappropriate time. I'm not falling for it, Box. It's about our project. I need to discuss some developments. Cass immediately turned in the other direction. He wasn't joking. This had to be about Evie. I'll be right there. Four minutes later, Cass entered an empty sick bay, with the exception of Box at the other end standing over one of the freestanding med stations. Come, look at this, he said, 
motioning Cass over. Where is everyone? Cass asked. I told them I accidentally dropped a vial of chlorine pentafluoride, he said. Cass jerked his head around, looking for the source. Just to give us a moment alone. Just to be clear, you didn't actually drop one, did you? He shook his head. But I wanted to show you this, because I think it's important. Also, Zack's nose. His heart jumped into his throat. Knows what? What I did to the captain. What we did. His voice was casual, as if they weren't about to be thrown to the brig along with Wolf for treason. Ha, 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 did... did Careful, or you'll end up like Vreej, Box said. I told her. She asked, and I told her. She's pretty smart. I don't think we would have gotten away with it. Cass's mind was racing. Surely Zax would want to reverse the procedure. How long has she known? He shrugged. A while now. But that's not why I called you in here. Look at this. He pointed to the screen. But Cass couldn't take his attention off the robot. We'll have to abandon the ship. There's no other choice. I'm not going back into a cell, Box. I just won't do it. Oh, calm your balls, Box replied. She's not going to say anything. Why not? Cass asked. I don't know. She said she wouldn't mention it to anyone. And the doc has never lied to me before. Why start now? Cass couldn't believe his idiocy. Sometimes Box could be simultaneously the dumbest and the smartest person in the room. Did you ever think she was telling you that to placate you into revealing everything? How do you know she's not talking to the captain right now? Because I told her three days ago. Don't you think if she was going to say something, she would have done it by now? Cass opened his mouth to argue, but couldn't come up with anything. Why was she waiting? What did Sachs have to gain by not informing Evie of their betrayal? Now, will you actually pay attention to the reason I asked you down here in the first place? Box asked. He pointed at the monitor again, full of medical data. After a moment, Cass realized they were looking at Evie's medical data, in real time. What is this? When I did the modification, I added a tiny monitor at the base of her skull to keep an eye on her brainwave patterns in case something went wrong. Wait a second, Cass said, stopping him. You added a monitor? Without telling me? Box shrugged. I thought that's what we were doing now. You don't tell her about what she did. I don't tell you about what I did. It all works. Cass balled his hands into fists. That's not what I meant. I see. You don't like it when you're not in control. Noted for your file and future sexual partners. Anyway, her brain waves have been relatively stable ever since the procedure. But there have been three different instances now where something doesn't look right. Cass let it go. The monitor was already in there. It didn't do any good to argue. What do you mean? With box, not right could mean anything. Cass had learned long ago to ask for a clarification. Look here, Box said, pointing to her brainwave patterns. This is her brain activity right now. See the blue line? Cass nodded. It was easy enough to follow. And it looked normal enough to his non-medically trained eyes. Now, look at this. Box moved the graph backward in time until Cass could see the pattern over the past few days. See these red spikes? Those aren't her brainwave patterns. They belong to someone else. The Athru, Cass said. She's breaking through the memory blocks. Box nodded. Yep, she's only managed a few temporary intrusions. But as time goes on, I expect she'll find her own way out. So what can you do about it? Cass asked. Me? Why would I do anything? We already tried to block out her memories. It isn't working. We're going to have to try again, Cass replied. If she had a relapse now, there was no telling what she could do. Cass didn't want to try to relieve her from command, as that would only invite more questions he didn't want to answer. No, the only solution was to replace the memory blocks and wait until it was safe to tell her, if he told her at all. Box shut off the monitor and crossed his arms. 
I'm not doing it again. Cass creased his brow. Why not? Because it didn't work. And it's not good for her. Imagine the kind of mental turmoil she's going through right now. You need to tell her. In fact, while we were in here discussing this, I asked her to come down to sickbay. You what? Cass had the sudden urge to throw up. And it was either the inconvenience of having somewhere to do it, or the fact of trying to explain to Zax why he'd lost his lunch all over her floor that prevented it. That's right. You need to fix this. No more hiding. That's not your call, Cass replied, running his hands through his hair. Don't you see how dangerous it is to tell her? Did you forget what happened back in that temple? She almost took you out of commission. She doesn't have any weapons this time. And I filled four of my finger syringes with doxetroban. Cass pinched the bridge of his nose. Let me get this straight. You want me to tell her the truth, just so you can knock her out again? And leave us right back in the same place we were before? Well, Bach said, hesitating, I was hoping this time we wouldn't need to knock her out. And why would this time be any different? Last time she thought she had control of that thing inside her, she ended up killing seven people. You want to take that chance again? Fox didn't respond for a moment. At first, Cass thought he was considering changing his mind, which Cass needed at the moment. It was bad enough Zax knew the truth. If somehow word got back to Evie, it could blow the blocks wide open again. All I know is, back when I was in danger, the captain fought for me. She wasn't going to let Paige pull me apart piece by piece, and she wasn't going to let him shoot me. I owe her the same. Since she's not here to argue for herself, I need to do it for her. She wouldn't want this, and you need to tell her the truth. Cass dropped his head for a moment. He was right. But the risk was so high he didn't know if he could do it. Where is she now? Based on when I made the comm, I would say she's probably on the hypervator between decks 10 and 11. If she's coming from the bridge. If she was coming from somewhere else, then she could be any... I just left from there, Cass replied, remembering why he'd been down here in the first place. He still had a difficult conversation with Zenfor ahead of him, and now another one with Evie. His eyes glazed over. I'll go tell her. Just like that? Box asked as Cass made his way to the door. The thought of having an armed security team with him when he confronted her crossed his mind. That wouldn't look suspicious at all. No, he didn't have a choice. He'd have to head her off and delay this until some time in the future. Which meant keeping her away from Box as well. Somehow. Cass turned back to Box. Yeah, just like that. The box inside his mind where he'd stored all the guilt he'd felt over what he'd done to Evie burst open, spilling its contents all over the place. And had Cass been alone, he might have doubled over. As it was, he managed to contain his feelings about what he was doing to Box and to Evie before they showed. Box's eyes only flashed twice, a quick pattern that said he was confused, but willing to go along. Did Box know Cass wouldn't tell her? He wasn't sure. He also wasn't sure how long he could keep the robot away from her. Because, with his big mouth, there was a very good chance it would be the first thing he mentioned upon seeing her again. And Cass couldn't allow that to happen. Not if he wanted to keep the situation contained. Out in the hallway, he passed Zax and the other medical staff. Cass acknowledged them with a nod, and while the other staff did the same, Zax remained stone-faced as he ambled past. He still couldn't understand why she hadn't gone to the captain yet. But he would take all the luck he could get. Whatever Zax's motivations, they currently worked in his favor. I take it the danger from the spill is cleaned up? Zax asked after he'd passed. Yep, all clean, he called back, not stopping. He couldn't bear to see the look on her face. Upon reaching the hypervator, he took a deep breath. This situation was spiraling out of control. Perhaps it was best to tell her. They could always confine her to the brig if they needed, though with her untapped strength and speed, 
would they even be able to catch and stop her? If that monster came out again, there was just no telling. He was so torn. He thought he'd made up his mind when the hypervader finally arrived. But when the doors opened and he found himself looking into Evie's deep green eyes, he realized he hadn't made up his mind at all. In fact, he was more indecisive than ever. Twenty-four. Oh, Evie said, taking a step back. She hadn't expected anyone to be right on the other side of the doors and was momentarily startled at Cass's appearance. But she managed to quickly right herself. It seemed she was so jumpy lately, like she was always on edge. Which, considering their current circumstances, was reasonable. Um, Box sent me a text com. I don't know why he didn't just use the system. He was trying to be sneaky, Cass blurted out. He seemed more anxious than normal as well. Maybe the situation had finally gotten to him, too. One of his many quirks, she said, stepping around him. He hadn't moved out of the way like a normal person would, so she shimmied past him, making a show of it to accentuate he had no manners. At least today he didn't. Care to join me in whatever news he deems fit to release? I've already spoken to him. It's nothing important. Another one of his random experiments. Why was he so sweaty? Was it that warm down here on 14? Or had he just been running from one end of the ship to the other? It's because he's lying to you, and he knows it. She almost screamed in response to the voice, half out of being startled for the second time in less than a minute, and half because she was sick of that goddamned voice in the back of her mind. She was convinced it was an unruly part of her subconscious, something she'd neglected to deal with over the past few years, because if it wasn't that, what else could it be? And for the most part, it had grown quiet ever since that day in the hallway. There had been a few slips, like in her office when Cass said he didn't know anything, or now. It seemed to only happen around Cass, or at least in his proximity. Could he have something to know about it? Cass's calm chirped. Rabot here, he said, looking relieved to have something to do with his hands. Just happened again. Small blip. Good luck. Box out. He smiled sheepishly, then cut the calm himself. What was that? Evie asked. He's tracking my anxiety levels, Cass replied, and he likes to alert me whenever I have a spike. Amusement grew on her face. Don't tell me I'm the reason for your anxiety. He waved her off. Not at all. It's just, I have a lot going on. Getting the new crew up to speed and making sure things are going off without a hitch. Lying! Do you need assistance? I could assign Captain Geisen to give you a hand. You two seem to work well together. Which makes sense. You did serve on the same ship for a long time. No, no, I can handle it, he said. In a couple of days I'll be fine. She focused in on him. Something was wrong. And she didn't like that she suspected him of lying. She needed to get this off her chest. Otherwise, she'd end up with anxiety. I need to ask you something. The other day, when you said you'd never heard of Esterva, were you lying? He went so pale she thought he might faint. So, she had her answer. Not to see if he would cop to it, or continue whatever charade he decided to engage in. The voice in her mind had been right after all. Of course I was right. I told you. She went stiff. Had it always referred to itself as I? She couldn't remember. But it was doing so now, and that was not her own mind. Finally, you're beginning to figure it out. Took you long enough? Who is speaking? This couldn't be real, could it? Poor thing. They messed with your mind so much you can't even remember. Don't worry. Dagnia will help you. I'll help you solve all your problems. Dagnia. That name. All this happened in the short span of seconds in which she thought Cass might faint. He continued to stare at her but he hadn't said anything. Cass, answer me. 
I mean, he began, fumbling. I guess it's possible I've heard it somewhere before. I don't keep track of every single word I hear. He tried to shrug it off, but failed miserably. What aren't you telling me, she asked, stepping closer to him. She could smell his aftershave, which was a nice change. There had been a time when he'd smelled of little more than body odor and vomit. Evie, I'm sorry. Here it came. But I don't know what you're talking about. See? Untrustworthy to his core. Tears stung her eyes, but she wasn't about to let them fall, not in front of him. Are you telling me I can't trust you anymore? That you'd rather cover up whatever this is than tell me the truth? She had thought they were past this, that all that time together had formed a stronger bond where they could rely on each other. She'd saved his life, goddammit, and he'd saved hers. What could be so important he couldn't tell her? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. His eyes turned downward like he was ashamed. Whatever the secret, it was eating him alive. She could see that much. But he had to be willing to talk about it if he wanted her to help him. And she needed to know why he knew this word in her mind. Don't worry. I'll help you with that. I know everything he's afraid to tell you. I'm not sure I trust you, Evie thought. If you can't trust yourself, who can you trust? She was confused. Does that mean you're part of me? That you are me? Yes, the voice replied. And for the first time since she'd come back from the planet, she felt a bit more like herself. She stepped back. Since you won't tell me, I have no choice but to believe everything you've said is a lie. Which means I think it's best if I go to sick bay alone. She turned to walk away before her anger replaced the pity she felt for him. No, wait, you can't, he said, jogging after her. She spun on him. Why not? What's in there? Answers to questions you don't want me to know? I know you don't believe me, but everything I've done, everything I'm doing, is in the best interest of you and the crew. You have to know I would never do anything to put either in danger. What really happened down on that planet? What isn't he telling you? I don't know if I can believe that, Cass. I recall being surprised to learn you were once an officer in the Coalition. Let me ask you. If someone else hadn't outed you, would you have ever pointed up that piece of information? He shook his head. That was nothing. Inconsequential. To you, maybe. But I'd like to know who I'm working with. And I thought we'd long gotten past this. But it's obvious to me that you don't trust my judgment. So I can only say the same thing for you. Because if you're lying about this, what else haven't you been honest about? What other secrets are you hiding? She worked her jaw, the anger bubbling up inside. And if you tell me one more time you're doing it for my own good, I'll relieve you of duty. At that, he shut up and dropped his hands to his sides. Yes, ma'am. Now, is there something you want to tell me? He drew in a deep breath through his nose. No, ma'am. Fine. Then get out of here. Go, do your job. And if I find even the slightest hint you're being dishonest, you'll find yourself in the brig beside Wolf faster than you can say hyperconductor. Do I make myself clear? He dropped his eyes again. Yes, ma'am. She turned away from him, fury burning inside her. How dare he? He wasn't her keeper, and it wasn't up to him to decide what she was and was not to know. She couldn't even imagine what could be so dire and so secret he felt the need to keep it from her. For a moment, she thought about going after him, ordering him to tell her, though she knew it would do no good. Even if he had been an officer, she had the feeling he would refuse the order. In fact, she had the feeling he would protect this secret, whatever it was, with his dying breath. And she didn't like how little sense that made. Could something have happened down on the planet? Voice? she asked in her mind. Danya? I wish to speak. Then I am at your service. 
As Captain Diazal walked past, she didn't see the body hunkered in the shadows. For that matter, neither had the traitor, Caspian. She had hidden herself so well in between the parts of the wall where the light didn't reach. She was sure even a creature who'd been born with the ability to see at night would have had a difficult time locating her. Was it pure luck she'd come upon these two in their squabbles? No. She'd been tailing the captain for days now, keeping an eye out for the safety of the crew, because there was no telling what she might do. After what had happened down on the planet, after what Diana had seen, the captain could never be trusted again. She watched from the shadows as the captain entered sickbay, curious about the encounter inside. She'd overheard her say they had answers for her in there. But what did that mean? That they were going to confront her about her crimes? Or were they going to help the traitor Caspian cover them up as well? Everyone knew his former partner worked as a doctor in there. Who knew what kind of influence he might have over the crew? He could knock out the entire crew if he wanted. All he'd need to do was dispense an airborne medicine through the ship's ventilation. And it wasn't as if he hadn't modified the ship's systems before. Diana had done her homework. When they'd been to the battle with the aliens and the ship's armor had been up, the robot managed to hack his way into the armor grid and drop the field for a split second to allow the shuttle to pass. The only reason Diana hadn't reported it was because the mission had resulted in the rescue of two of her pilots. But even then, they were the two least loyal to her. Maybe she should report it, see if the captain would be willing to move against the robot. It would make for an interesting experiment. Then again, she had no idea what might set the captain off. She'd been concerned the argument with the traitor might have done it. But so far, she didn't seem to be flying into a blind, murderous rage. Either way, Diana knew to keep her distance when she needed to. She also knew she was this ship's only hope for surviving the captain. Because if that fool Rabot wasn't going to do anything about her, then Diana would. She would make sure the captain paid for all those people she killed. One way or another, she'd make sure. Once the captain was safely inside, Diana left her hiding alcove, hopping out and strolling along the corridor as if she'd always been there. But she had a very particular destination in mind. She just needed to figure out how to get in and out without too much mess. And while the captain was in sickbay, this was the perfect opportunity to exploit it. She made her way down the hall to the next hypervator, taking it up to level 9 and hopping off with a smile on her face. She'd heard about the altercation of the bridge from the security officer, Ryder. Technically, she'd heard it from Isaiah Squires, who was romantically involved with Ryder. But the information had come from Ryder, nonetheless, as he escorted Wolf off the bridge and down here to the brig. The woman had had the right idea, pulling a weapon on the captain, and it seemed to Diana that she was the only one willing to do what was necessary to get the job done, to keep this crew safe, and to keep them out of the inevitable path of the Athru. The longer they stayed in Coalition space, the more likely they were to run into them again. And Diana didn't care what kind of safeguards they had. Nothing would ever be enough. Time on the planet had proved that much. As Diana entered the brig, she locked eyes with Ryder himself. This had been part of her plan. Coming here when he was on duty assured her an audience with the one occupant of the brig. Though she'd been afraid she would have to leave her watch over the captain in order to make this meeting. But fortune had been on her side, and now she had some time for a conversation. Is she awake? Diana asked. Ryder nodded. She just finished with another visitor. Diana forced her face into a neutral expression. It couldn't have been Caspian. Who else would come to see her? Who? The new captain, Geisen. Diana took a moment to digest the information. What did that mean? Why would Geisen be interested in talking with someone who'd pulled a weapon on the captain? Diana couldn't be sure, but it was worth investigating. It was possible Geisen might make a powerful ally. Especially if Diana was right about what was coming. Thanks, she said. 
Ryder nodded, tapping a button on his console that opened the security door to the brig itself. Diana stepped through, noting they'd put Wolf in the largest cell, the middle one. She'd been laying on the shelf in the cell and glanced over when Diana entered, tenting her body and moving into a sitting position. Chief Ravenkel, what are you doing here? Diana smiled. I'd like to talk, if you're not too busy. And call me Diana. Wolf screwed up her face. I don't understand. Is there a problem with the space wings? Because Vreej or even Tyler can probably take a look for you. I'm uh, incapacitated. Just a misunderstanding, I'm sure, Diana said. Though I was surprised to hear about what happened. Wolf waved her hand dismissively. I don't want to talk about it. A temporary lapse in judgment. I'm just not... I think it's just the pressure and all the changes. She tried to put on her most sympathetic face. You've been on this ship a long time. You were in command for a long time. It must be hard to transition back. Yes, Wolf said, relief in her voice. That's it exactly. I came to think of this as my ship. And when everyone showed up again, it was hard to give it back. Even harder to see none of you had aged today. Oh, trust me, some of us did, Diana replied. Much more than others. Her eyes met Diana's. I don't understand. I thought you were only down to the planet for a day or two. Only those who were in Wave 2. Those of us in Wave 1 were there an entire season. And I counted every one of those 73 days by the hour. Trust me. She dropped her gaze again. Oh, I'm sorry. I haven't read all the reports yet, and I guess I thought I didn't need to. I didn't realize. Diana turned to the side. It's fine. We lost a few out there, but most of us made it. The worst part of it was listening to that robot prattle on nonstop for week after week. I'd hoped he'd had a limited lifetime power cell, but no, it still goes strong even to this day. Wolf grinned. Yeah, Box is a unique individual. But he's also powered by a dual fusion core that can last up to 700 years, if I'm not mistaken. Top of the line stuff. Diana tried to catch her gaze again. She didn't want to waste time with the robot. There were more important issues to discuss. I need to know why you pulled a weapon out of the captain. I need to understand your reasoning. Wolf stared at the floor, silent for a few moments. Diana thought she might have pushed too hard, caused her to clam up. But then she finally spoke. I don't think we should be going from planet to planet looking for allies. There are no more allies. It's better we get out of the area, head for unexplored territory. At least out there, an alien race isn't trying to kill us every day. But I forgot my place for a moment. I forgot those are no longer my decisions to make. What if I told you the captain was a security risk? Diana asked. How so? She was compromised down on the planet. I saw it myself. It was time to put Wolf to the test. If she passed, she might find herself on the other side of that force barrier. What do you mean compromised? She had the former bridge engineer's attention now. I watched her murder seven of her own crew, and I wasn't the only one. Wolf's eyes had doubled in size. Caspian and Bach saw it too, then covered it up. That... Do you have proof? I know what I saw. And if you doubt me, just ask the robot. He's terrible at keeping secrets. It didn't matter if she didn't have hard evidence. She'd seen the fear in Caspian's eyes when she'd confronted him. That was all the proof she needed that she hadn't been hallucinating. But I don't understand. Why would she turn against her own crew? What did she gain from it? I saw it for myself. It's because she's not human. She moved faster and was stronger than any human could ever be. She moved like them. And I think that's what Caspian is so desperate to keep under wraps. 
Wolf stood. But if she's one of them, why not kill us all immediately? What is she waiting for? Diana had plenty of theories, but one stood out in her mind. It's because she's waiting until she has us in a false sense of security. Then she can take us all out at once, like a trap with a trip spring. Everything has to be perfect. She checked her calm. They might not have a lot of time. I assume you're not going to stand by and let that happen. No, Diana narrowed her eyes. It's my job to make sure she never gets the chance. 25. Cass made his way into engineering, his heart hammering. Not only did he feel sick after his encounter with Evie, he now was potentially putting his life on the line by confronting Zenfor again. Not that he thought she would actually kill him, but as the incident with Samaya illustrated, she was stronger than she knew. And in the time they had been away, somehow she'd grown stronger still. He wondered if that was a genetic trait of all Sill, or if she had done something special. The last few times he'd tried this, he'd been rewarded with being knocked to his ass and a fractured jaw. If he wasn't careful, this time could be worse. But despite their previous encounters, Cass needed to do this, for Samaya. He'd considered everything from retrieving his boom cannon from the weapons lockup to bringing Talia and an armed security team with him. But in the end, it was best if he did this without provoking her, though he'd needed to take a few moments to himself to process what had happened with Evie. She knew now he was lying to her, no question. He could only hope she had enough trust in him that she'd let it go for now. Unless Box ended up letting it slip. There was no way he couldn't tell her, but he needed to wait for the right moment. And until the ship was no longer alone out here, he couldn't subject the crew to a captain who wasn't at the top of her game. Then again, he might not have that much time. It was obvious the entity inside her was growing stronger, releasing more information. It might only be a matter of time before it finally became dominant again and sent Evie on a second rampage, or incapacitated her with grief. Maybe Box was right. Knocking her out again might be their best option, for the crew's sake as much as for hers, at least until they could wake up Sester and figure out a way to get that thing out of her. The door rolled away, and Cass couldn't help but stare at the dormant form of the Claxian as he ambled past, curled into a sphere and laying off to the side of his cradle, almost like he'd been discarded. Some of the engineering staff walked by without so much as a glance. They were probably those who'd stayed aboard and thus were used to him in this form. But to Cass, it was damn odd. Zenfor was at her usual station, monitoring the engines as they rocketed through the undercurrent. Cass had to admit it was as smooth of a ride as he'd ever experienced, Whatever she'd done when she rebuilt the engines had been a massive improvement. He took a deep breath, steadying himself. It was time to perform his duty. Consul, do you have a moment? He clasped his hands behind him so she couldn't see they were clammy, and he attempted to wipe them on the back of his shirt without looking too conspicuous. Zenfor's eyes slid to the side, and he disengaged with her terminal to face him. Make this quick. I don't like to leave the system unmonitored for too long. It's still proving itself. We need to talk about your actions the other day in the hallway with Captain Geisen. She narrowed her eyes, but hadn't moved yet, which he took as a good sign. We already discussed it. Not your punishment. Captain Diazal and I have made a decision. But first, I'd like your assessment of what happened. The captain and I argued. He arched his eyebrows. Is that all? To the best of my recollection. She wasn't going to make this easy for him. He had expected as much. You don't recall a physical altercation? I may have moved her out of my way. Zenford turned her attention back to her terminal. She wasn't getting away that easily. Consul, this is a very serious problem... You fractured two of her bones and punctured an internal organ when you knocked her aside. Zenfor stopped. 
She was injured. It wasn't a question, just a statement of fact. Cass thought he saw a crack in her features. She was. It could have been much more serious. It was not my intention to harm her. Older humans are brittle. Cass tried to read the emotions in her face, but came up short. Yes, we are. You assaulted another member of this crew. Given these facts, how should you be punished? Cass was sure she was about to minimize the incident again. She'd always had a temper, and it had finally caught up with her. Either that, or she was about to punch him. Given the available evidence and the code of conduct on this ship, I should be confined. She stepped down the first step from her terminal location. Caught off guard, Cass wasn't sure how to respond. She was right. She should be confined. She'd committed a crime against a fellow crew member and needed to pay the price. That's correct. Was she surrendering or preparing to cause another physical altercation? You will need to notify Lieutenant Tyler. He can monitor the upgrades while I am away. He knows the system. You're coming willingly? Yes, I have committed a crime. I must face the appropriate punishment. Cass had to stop his mouth from falling open. He hadn't expected this response. In fact, he'd expected the opposite. But how would that have gone? Had she refused, was she willing to fight off the whole ship's security force? She could do it. But was that in her best interest? He was glad she decided it wasn't. I'll need to confine you to quarters, until I hear different from the captain. Zenfor nodded, turning back to her station. For a second, he thought it had all been a ruse, nothing more than to lull him into a false state of security. But all she did was lock her station, so none of the controls could be modified until someone else took over. She then nodded at him to proceed. Cast tapped his calm. Tyler? I need you to take over for Zenfor until further noticed. Acknowledge, Commander, he replied, doing a bad job of stifling a yawn on the other end. I'll be there in a few minutes. Tied her out. It will be fine until then, Zenfor said. Do you need to notify security to escort me? I don't think that's necessary, Cass said, dropping his guard a little. She wasn't giving him any resistance, which was unlike her. Or at least the old her, the one he'd seen in the hallway earlier. Thankfully, she seemed to want to be reasonable. Cass stayed beside her as they left engineering, heading for the hypervators that would take them up to the crew quarters. He thought for a moment it might be a silent trip, but it turned out he was mistaken. I didn't mean for this to happen. And I hope Captain Geisen isn't permanently hurt, she said once they stepped inside the hypervator. Box and Zax took care of her. She'll be fine. Cass waited a beat. Why did you come so willingly? he asked. She stared straight ahead. Before he uh, retreated, Sester told me I should try to understand humans better. I didn't know what he meant at the time. But after spending years observing them, I think I do now. Because, despite all of it, we do have certain similarities. Our drive to complete our goals... Our anger in times of trial or sorrow. Human and Sill share these traits. And the longer I've been with your people, the more I've begun to understand that. Cass worked hard to keep the smile off his face. Does that mean we're no longer inferior life forms, not worth the Sill's time or attention? For this Sill, that's exactly what it means. And I believe if more of my people were to interact with yours, we might come to different conclusions about your culture. But then again, I have a long period of experience to draw from, which my peers never would. They would have to trust you, which doesn't come easily to my people. Cass couldn't help but think of the judgment chambers, where he'd almost slipped in all the blood and remnants of creatures long since executed. No kidding. The doors opened, and she took the lead, heading for her quarters. He still couldn't quite wrap his head around her attitude. 
Does this mean the Sill might be wrong about other cultures as well? She reached her door, then faced him. Perhaps. But it isn't for me to decide. However, if we ever return to Sill space, I will present my evidence. I will fight for humanity. In that moment, Cass was struck by her earnestness and loyalty, neither of which he'd ever expected from her. But there she was, prepared to accept the punishment of her actions and pledging herself to not a coalition cause, but a human one. He wanted to hug her, but he thought that might be a bridge too far. Then he would be on his ass. Thank you, he replied. I'd like to think you'd do the same in my position. Senfor tapped the button beside her door. It slid open without a sound. I'll remain here until I hear from you or the captain. He nodded, speechless. And, Caspian, I am sorry. The doors closed, and Cass found himself alone in the hallway, his feet glued to the floor. Had that just happened? He couldn't wait to tell Evie. Evie? She was with Box and Zax right now. Could they have already told her? Or had Box taken it upon himself to knock her out again? He wasn't sure. Either way, it wouldn't do any good for him to come busting in the middle. I'd like to think you'd do the same in my position. Senfor hadn't been talking about it directly, but she'd injured a fellow crewmate and was now accepting the consequences of that action. Wasn't that what Cass had done to Evie? Even if it was without her knowledge? And he'd gotten away consequence-free. No, he needed to accept the consequences of his actions. He was done trying to manipulate the situation. Box was right. As soon as she returned, he would tell her everything, like he should have done from the beginning.